In this video, we're going back to uh, some uh, basic uh, group theory definitions and uh, terminology, which are going to be useful in understanding this statement and, and proving this statement, group convolutions are all you need. And if you look into the literature on group convolutional neural networks, you see that uh, the more, more general papers, they focus on this idea of group convolutions for homogeneous spaces and quotient spaces. And um, yeah, so, so I'm going to define uh, these, uh, these constructs uh, in this video. And in order to define what a homogeneous space is, we have to uh, revisit uh, the group action. Uh, we've seen this uh, pop up several times already, right? So the, the group action is an operator so much like uh, the group product is a binary operator, but this one takes a group element as input and an element from a space on which it acts and spits out a transformed element uh, in that space. Right? So uh, maybe this, uh, this example uh, exemplifies it. So I have a point X in my space X, and then this group action transforms X via some, some group action, uh, some group element, and that you know, spits out this transformed point over here. And we call it the group action if it satisfies this, uh, um, this equation, right? So I could either uh, nest these group actions one after each other with two different group elements. Or I can do it as one in, at once with, um, uh, you know, the group product of these individual uh, group elements. So I could either transform this point once, transform it again. That brings me to this transform point. But I could also go that directly uh, via uh, the action of the group product of these two uh, group elements. So in that sense, the group action describes a group homomorphism. Okay, and we saw that this group action is important because if we uh, deal with functions on some space and we know how to transform the domain of such functions, then we can also transform these, these functions themselves via uh, what, what we call the, the regular representation and start building group convolutional neural networks uh, with them. And now there's a property of an action uh, called transitivity. Uh, we call an action transitive if um, it acts on a space X in such a way that if I take any two points in the space X, uh, there exists a group element such that I can transform one of the points to the other one. Right. So if I have, let's say, uh, an origin or a point in my 2D plane, then I can tra transform this, for example, by the translation group. I can move this point to any other point in space. So um, that means that the entire group, if I let the entire group act on this point, that's denoted as such. So this creates, so G is a set of all the group elements. This then creates also a set of points in the space. And that is here uh, marked in blue. So if I apply all group elements to this single point that I have over here, then I'm basically covering my entire space uh, R2. So if this happens, if um, I can reach any point from a fixed origin, for example, if I, with the group action, then I say that the, the group acts transitively on that particular space, in this case, R2. Now, another example of a group that acts transitively on R2 is the rotor translation group. And I'm now depicting this, uh, depicting this with an arrow to also illustrate the rotation part. So if I take an origin uh, somewhere, uh, um, and I let uh, the rotor translation group act on it, I can move it to some other point in space, right? And with this group action, so I could rotate this, move it to this point, I could rotate it slightly differently, I can move it to this point, and I can move it to all these points in my space. So SE2 acts transitively on R2. Now a notable difference between uh, the translation group acting on R2 is that if I want to move this point to here, there's only one unique translation that brings me there. In the SE2 case, I can first rotate this point and then translate it, or first rotate it differently and then translate it. So there's multiple actions that uh, map one point to the other. Uh, we will touch upon this uh, notion in, in the next uh, slides. But the idea is that any point can be reached uh, by fixing some origin and move it around. So SE2 acts transitively on R2. Now, an example of a group that acts on R2, but not transitively, is the rotation group, the 2D rotation group. Um, this is illustrated over here. Suppose I have fixed a certain point and I'm going to rotate it around uh, this, this point, uh, the origin, for example. Then I create this set of point, right? Every rotation gives me some point on a ring centered around 
well, my chosen chosen center of uh, rotation. So you'll see that um, if I apply all my possible group elements on this uh, this origin, I create this, this ring structure and I'm not covering the full domain R2. I mean, I could pick a different point and uh, rotate it and it gives me a different ring. I can pick a different point and rotate it and, and it gives me a different ring. But given one single fixed point, I cannot possibly cover the entirety of R2. And it, this doesn't mean that the rotation group acting on R2 isn't uh, useful in that case. There's still many applications where it's useful to let S SR2 act on R2. Uh, but this, it basically means that uh, I have to treat every ring uh, separately. There's not one uni unique orbit, uh, let's say, that, that covers the entire uh, space that I'm interested in. This actually brings me to terminology which I haven't introduced yet. So this over here is called uh, the orbit of x0 uh, generated by the group G. Um, right? So in these transitive cases, the orbits of a fixed origin generate the whole space uh, on which the group acts. Um, but in this case, where the group doesn't act transitively on uh, the space, these are orbits that do not cover uh, the full space. And uh, so if you want to cover the whole space, then we have to uh, separately index or um, consider all these different orbits uh, with different rings. Okay, and now that we know what a transitive group action is, uh, the definition of a homogeneous space is simply a space on which G acts transitively. So um, this, this is important uh, because if we know we're dealing with homogeneous spaces, then we can actually guarantee that every part of a signal can be seen or probed by a convolution kernel. And this is exemplified with this, right? We saw this in the, in the first uh, couple of videos that a convolution operator is based on the translation group and the translation group acts transitively on the space uh, R2. And this basically means if I have a function on R2, so which assigns for every position some feature value, then I can probe this kernel by, uh, you know, uh, moving it everywhere over my space. And I can do this because the translation group acts transitively on uh, R2. And similarly, the rotate, roto translation group, SE2, also acts transitively on uh, R2. Now, another relevant example of homogeneous spaces is the sphere S2. And it's relevant uh, once we start considering uh, 3D uh, group convolutional neural networks in, in the next and uh, the, the third uh, lecture. Um, so yeah, we know that the sphere uh, is a, a two-dimensional uh, manifold, and it can be actually parameterized by two angles, and uh, a beta and a gamma um, rotation or a rotation angle, where beta is a rotation along uh, the y-axis and gamma along the z-axis. So this already tells us that there are rota rotations in SO3 that, uh, by which we can reach every point on the sphere. And what I depicted in this figure is um, a visualization of the parameter space of these rotations, right? Because we can parameterize a rotation by a rotation along the x-axis, over the x-axis, over the y-axis with the beta rotation and the z-axis with the gamma rotation. And the beta and gamma cover the sphere, so that's depicted with, with the sphere. And then this alpha rotation um, is here illustrated as moving away uh, or towards uh, the sphere. And that's really just a, a visualization thing, right? And this alpha axis wraps around and, and goes back uh, and forth, right? It's a periodic axis that runs from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so this is uh, what it looks like. So uh, suppose we have an object, it could be a convolution kernel. I can uh, rotate it, right? So I can rotate it along uh, the x-axis, uh, y, and, and z-axis. And that gives me some pose, uh, some state of the object, which I can represent with this point in this uh, 3D space. And if our object has a particular symmetry in them, uh, in it, then a rotation along the over the x-axis, so this alpha rotation, doesn't change anything uh, to to its its state. Uh, let's say, right? So it should all be identified with the same point, and that's uh, illustrated over here. So I uh, remove these shells and just and just maintain this red line. See, we still have these alpha rotations, but they don't do anything. So I can associate every state over this red line with one and the same uh, state in a beta uh, gamma uh, coordinates. And that's what we mean when we talk about quotient spaces. So we, we can we write something like the two sphere is the quotient of the full 
SO3 group with these subgroup SO2 rotations, uh, let's say factored out, and they're all corresponding to the same uh, point in S2. So again, now the, the, the shape is aligned. If I rotate it over the subgroup alpha, so the subgroup SO2, then the state doesn't really change. Uh, okay, that's denoted then uh, in this uh, notation. So this quotient space is equivalent to uh, the two sphere. So let's try to formalize this a little bit. So we define a quotient space, a G uh, slash H, as the space of unique cosets, G H, where a coset is really uh, a set H. So H was the subgroup, which I can shift around via an action of the group, right? So this red line over here represents such a coset H. And I can move this, this line around to another point in space by just multiplying it with a group action. So I could rotate it and that shifts this set to another location. And okay, so the, the quotient space is the space of all these unique cosets that I could put on top of uh, the sphere. So it is a space, but its elements are really spaces in themselves, right? It's this collection of points uh, that all belong to the same uh, set. And by construction, we have that if we take some group element within such a, a set and I multiply it on the right with an H, so I rotate along this, uh, this axis, for example, I will stay within this set. Um, so right multiplication, multiplication with elements in H uh, for a particular point in a set doesn't really leave the set. So we always stay within this uh, fiber, uh, let's say. Now, and one way to identify uh, these fibers such that we can construct such uh, quotient spaces is via the stabilizer. So the stabilizer uh, denoted as uh, such, uh, the stabilizer of the group G, uh, sorry, the stabilizer of the point X0 uh, in the group G is a subset of G that leaves X0 unchanged, right? That means the stabilizer is given by the, all the group elements that have this property that if the group uh, action is applied to x0, I leave the, the point x0 intact. Okay, and that, that's illustrated in, in this figure, right? So this, this symmetric shape, all these rotations alpha leave the shape intact. Or maybe put similarly, I can pick a point on S2, for example, the x-axis or the, the vector direction pointing in along the x-direction. This vector uh, direction on S2 uh, stays invariant under all these subgroup rotations around uh, the x-axis. So by picking a reference point in our homogeneous space, we can find or figure out what are the group uh, elements that leave this uh, point intact. And that forms a subgroup uh, called the stabilizing uh, subgroup of this uh, particular point uh, X0. And so this is a way of thinking about uh, homogeneous spaces as, as quotient uh, spaces, which, which tells us that if the homogeneous space is uh, of lower dimension of the group itself, then there must be um, groups that leave certain points invariant, uh, invariant. and this uh, puts some constraints on our convolutional neural networks as we will see uh, later on. Okay, and this is then an important remark that if we talk about homogeneous spaces, we might as well uh, talk about uh, quotient spaces, right? Because here I have a homogeneous space, the sphere, so uh, I, I'm talking about points on the sphere, but all these uh, fibers, all these sets can be identified with a certain base point on the sphere. So I can talk about uh, the quotient space as a bunch of sets uh, that I all want to treat equivalently, or I can talk about uh, the identifiers that point towards these sets, let's say the, the base points uh, on the sphere. And so you can show this, I put this in, in the lecture notes if you want to uh, check that out. Yeah, and this is then also taken from the lecture notes as an example to show that uh, um, when we talk about quotient spaces, we are able to identify, let's say, uh, a base point on the homogeneous space that point towards these, uh, the, the, these, these cosets. Where in this example, we treat the Euclidean plane uh, RD as the quotient of SED, SED so the roto translation group, uh, factoring out, let's say, uh, the rotations, leaving only the translations. Uh, so we can say H is the group of the zero translations and the rotations, so all the rotations uh, around uh, the origin. Uh, so these are all the group elements that leave the, the zero vector uh, or the identity element of the translation group intact. So that then forms uh, a quotient uh, space of cosets GH, where H was indeed all this rotation, zero translation, which I can move around uh, via the group action uh, G in the element in SA3. 
So if I write this out as, as a translation X and a rotation R, then uh, we have R acting on the identity. Sorry for switching notation here. I also see some <laughs> sloppy uh, mistakes there. Um, I guess you can expect many of them in the lecture notes. But you'll see the rotation acting on the zero vector. Okay, that doesn't do anything. So what remains is X and I have R, R uh, tilde. And since we're covering the entire set of rotations in uh, SOD, this R times R tilde will also be in, uh, in this set. So this set is left unchanged by uh, multiplying all these R's on the left with R. So that means the only thing that is left uh, invariant uh, in this coset is this X. So that really means uh, that we can identify all these cosets with a base point in our homogeneous space, namely this uh, translation uh, element X. Okay, so I've put several of such examples in the, in the lecture notes and I hope they help you um, getting some intuition and feel about uh, these uh, technical uh, terms. But in essence, a homogeneous space X is a space on which a group G X transitively. And this is important because this guarantees us that any point in X can be reached by the action of the group. For example, when we do template matching, we want to be able to scan the entire uh, feature space. And this is more like a technical uh, conclusion, like a homogeneous space can always be identified with a quotient space and the other way around. And this is important when we want to identify if there are any invariance uh, constraints that we want to, uh, that we need to take care of.